Hey guys, what's going on? It's Kova with Tweak Music Tips. Today we have the honor of having DJ Magic Mike, an amazing producer DJ. Independently, he sold 1.5 million records. So that's just enough to let you know that uh, he's the real deal. But really quickly, I want to give a big shout out to our sponsor, KPODJ.com. Shout out to them. Let me bring up their thing right here. So they've been in business for about 18 years and they've been helping djs with their audio and dj equipment and now they actually started doing stuff with uh producers so they've been helping us out and they're going to be giving away 450 dollars ape lab lights so we're going to give a giveaway link on the screen here let's do this uh give tweak music tips forward slash giveaway if you're in uh instagram we're going to make sure that you click on the link in the bio there. I'm going to be giving away $450 lights. Uh, these are great for streaming and all kinds of things. And we're really excited to be doing it. Guys, today's a big, big deal. This guy's such a great, great guy. Uh, veteran in the game, over 25 years in the game. Actually, more than that. But And uh, he's someone who's a super, super valuable person in the industry, etc. So we really want you to learn from him. So DJ Magic Mike, he started his career at 15, 16 years old. He was actually called Mix Master Mike. And he's based out of Orlando, Florida. He was on two urban stations, one on Friday, one on Saturday. He started DJing at a skating rink. He eventually bought an 808 and started messing around and really just learning. He actually did a lot of stuff with another independent in Miami and then eventually went to Cheetah Records, was partners on, and he put out uh, so many good records. They did the Boot Booty, Magic Mike Cuts the Record, and his first two albums combined were 1.5 million records. So DJ Magic Mike dropped the bass on YouTube currently has 2.9 million streams. So He's someone who's, I mean, just amazing, amazing, amazing. So I don't want to keep hyping him up. We want to bring him in the stream. So let's bring out Magic Mike. Mike, what's going on, brother? What's good, man? How you doing, man? We try, we're trying to get you out of here, man. <laughs> That's what's up, man. Yo, man. So so good to have you on, bro. We've been talking about this for a while now. And, you know, you got a busy schedule, so we completely understand. But uh, it, it's good to get you on here and, and really just share your story and stuff like that. So That's cool, man. I'm glad, glad that, to be here. First of all, how are you doing, Mike? How's everything going? I'm blessed, man. Everything good. I can't complain. And tell me how you felt after your last uh, live stream. It was a it was a pretty big deal. Uh yeah, that one was uh it was kind of insane for us. You know, we really didn't realize what the numbers were until you know later on after the stream. You know, it ended, and my wife looked and told me exactly how many we had. You know, and it was uh that was kind of amazing. It was shocking, but amazing because you know I'm kind of not a streamer. You know, so this is, this is all new to me. So we decided to, you know, to go ahead and do it and tackle it and that, you know, dive in head first. So it was good, man. I'm happy. Yeah, yeah. So for guys, like I said, he he hit thirty thousand streams over thirty now, probably. I think it was yeah. the next day you already had thirty. Yeah. About five hundred and seventy, almost on a, on your way to six hundred uh, shares, and it was actually amazing to me on. There's a couple of things. One is you're not a streamer, like you said, and I don't think people really understand this, guys. I, I want you to really take note of this. He's not a streamer, but he figured it out. And what I love about Mike is when we were chatting, like this is something you really researched. Like you really reached out to people. Some people were, you know, uh, you know, you you eventually had to figure it out yourself. You know, yeah. you had your vision. So what what was it like? What what made you? I mean, it was weeks, right? I, you really prepared for the first one. It, it, yeah, it it was almost three weeks. Three was going on a month that it took me to prepare for the first one. Okay. Because uh, I kept getting people hitting me up. When you going live, when you going live, because, you know, all the other DJs was alive and, you know, I'm like, yeah, I don't want to do that. You know, it's just, it was, I had a lot of other things going on at the time. You know, even though we quarantined, we still working, you know? Yeah. So uh, I had, uh, had a lot of other things going on. So I just really wasn't even considering it. And then I thought, you know, my birthday is coming up. So I'm like, well, that might be a good day to go live, you know? So then I started doing some research on it to see, how hard was this going to be? Because I didn't want to go the route of just turning your phone on and hitting live and, and letting it go that way because I've heard some that sound good and I've heard some that don't sound so good. Mm. So I wanted to do some research. And then once I did, you know, once I dived in and I realized, you know, I might, might be biting off more than I can chew with this <laughs> one. So then I started reaching out to some people that I knew that was doing it well and, you know, got some advice and got some help from some close friends. And, you know, and, and this is where we're at now. But but the, this is the thing, guys. This was his second stream, and your first stream was super successful. You did yeah. such a great job. And then this last one, tell us the theme too that what you did on this last one. Um, well, this one I wanted to go towards my EDM community, my breakbeat, my breakbeat community, and uh, because 
I'm kind of one of the DJs that kind of straddles the fence between multiple genres, mm. you know, so I got fans, you know, on my hip hop side, my old school side, but then I got fans on my EDM side as well. So, you know, the first stream, I wanted to go towards my roots and do, you know, do my my, my, my Miami based stuff. And then on the second one, I wanted to go towards my breakbeat fans. So <laughs> with the breakbeat fans, I knew that I had to kind of change because I didn't want everything to be the same, you know, like I've, as, from the first stream. So went, you know, did a little work and, you know, got the visuals together and, and all that and, and tried to cater to the music, you know, for the most part. You killed it. What was great was in the middle of the set, you guys stopped, you did a shot. <laughs> it was yep. a where they shot and you guys, uh, yep. it was a lot of fun, man. What I loved about not only your stream, and this is one of the things that I want to really talk about the people that are looking into streaming or actually stream is Mike was really in the zone, but at the same time there was interaction. Um, and I love that you pause them between parts and just really acknowledge the crowd. So I thought that was great, man. Yeah. Rest of you. That was good. Okay. So a couple of things I want to go over. Um, you know, th there's so many things we can get into, and he has such an extensive history. But I really want you guys to know who Mike, uh, Magic Mike, is the person. DJ Magic Mike is the person because uh, we, you and I met in 2014. Uh, we met through records, and one of the records we were playing, uh, we put out, you actually played. So I my, did. my family's in Orlando, and we went to go see this guy. Now, I want you guys to look at this. So I meet this guy, we met online through a record, whatever, and then you know, you say, hey, I'm playing your record, whatever. And we go to House of Blues and he has this industry night. Now, mind you, it's what what was it? A Monday? Industry Monday? Sunday, or Sunday? Sunday, Sunday, night, Sunday night, yeah. Legendary, just so you know. And it's probably 4,000 people in this place. My man's on this big ass stage. And I walked in and I was like, this is Sunday. Like, you know what I'm saying? And I was like, and you had the crowd, you know what I mean? This is your your crowd, like you 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 yeah. you know in the oh this is your area. So, and we get to the back of the booth, and you know you were super hospitable and stuff, and you played the record, and you guys had all this stuff going with all the other records and everything. And I was really really taken back. And what was great was you were done with your set, and here come all the DJ homies, and you just chilling with everybody talking. And we had our your mutual friend Vic. I I knew him. My brother, before. yeah. That's your best friend, man. He's, yeah. Such a great guy, and we yeah, linked up in 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 Pennsylvania, small world, uh, one of the places I played. And yeah. man, that's crazy. So, what is it about you playing all these years, man, and just still doing these big crowds, connecting with the people, and uh, like like like, what is it? What what makes you tick? Like what what it is about this? Um, that's a hard question, but I I don't know. I kind of put it to the love of music. You know, I love DJing. You know, I love um, I love the reaction that I get, you know, from a crowd, you know, when you drop something dope or even when you drop something that they don't know what it is. And you just get you just get that reaction, you know, that energy that you get from that crowd that feeds me. And then that makes me want to do even more, you know, so it's almost like a, a one two punch thing. You know, I'm giving you you give me and we just keep it going all night, you know, for the whole set. But I just love spinning man. I love music and I love spinning. That's cool. What's what's also know, and what I really want people to connect though is it's such a big crowd, but at the same time you're connecting with the crowd. And I think that's something that stood out to me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, and because you know you're an Orlando native and you've been playing in all these places, uh, you know, throughout Florida and, and throughout the country, um, I thought it was interesting because I feel like sometimes when you play for a bigger crowd, there's like a disconnect or whatever, and you just like <laughs> just nah. you play and the vinyl and I, I like being personable with people, man. You know, it's just it goes a long ways when when you're playing you know just be personable even if you don't say anything as long as your music vibes with them you know you vibing with them they vibe with you and you just kind of you just build build a rapport with everybody man you know and that's what i i always try to do i mean you're not gonna click with everybody but i try to click with the majority you know and like if you come see me spinning then you pretty much are already know what you're gonna get we're we gonna have a good time whether you know the music, whether you don't know the music or whatever what's going on, you I'm gonna try to make sure you have a good time. I love it. I love it. So everybody is on here. So your boy Vic Ferreira is on here. So shout out to yeah. him. What up, Vic? We were just talking about you, man. So everybody here is talking about your uh Twitch feed that you had and your last uh show, and everyone seems to have loved it. So we appreciate yeah. everybody who's on here. And what we want to do is break. We're uh we wanna break the 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 record we have, which is 172. Just so share you know, it. share yeah. it. 
Make sure you share. You got to tell your people, Mike. Yeah, you got to make sure you share. share it. Share it. Share it. <laughs> we got to get as many people on here. So, because we want to, we want the one of the things I think that you're so behind the scenes, and it's funny because you did something for the Red Bull Academy, but I looked at, I did a lot of research on a lot of your interviews, and you really do a lot of interviews. You're really a behind the scenes guy. Nah, I'm not a, I'm not a big talk. I'm not a big interviewer. So <laughs> I kind of let, I sit back and just let things work, you know? Yeah, this is great. All right. That so, Red, that, you- that Red Bull interview was kind of amazing, though, because it was long. We yeah. did that, uh, we did that in Rome, like, Oh man, ten or fifteen years ago, something like that. But that that was a good interview. But it was the yeah. interview was really good. Hour and a half, just so you know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> once they when they um because they gave me the DVD of it once it was all said and done. So I I still have it in my collection. So Scotty B, uh, Scott Butcher from our promo only promotions says, "What's up, Mike or Let O G Jess?" Uh, let's see, what's from Virgin Island? Danced all the way through the house. Nice shout out to them. That's what's up. Uh, a lot of a breakbeat for life. Look at these people. Oh, there we go. We love it. Okay, cool. So let's uh, let's go a little bit into your story. Uh, yes, all right. So now you started up as uh, you know, we won't say how long ago, but your early days, 15, 16 yeah. years old. It was wow. Uh, you started up as a uh, mix master, mix master Mike. So tell us how that started. That was my first name. Um, you know, back in I, I ain't afraid to say when it is because I, I I appreciate my history. Yeah, yeah. Know, but uh, yeah, mid '80s, early '80s, actually, my uh, first DJ name was Mixmaster Mike, and uh, started in some clubs when I was junior high, you know, early in high school, and kind of started, got, you know, had a friend, uh, a friend of my mom's was a PD at a radio station, and kind of took me under his wing and got me in the radio, and the name changed, and you know, and all of that. So, but yeah, we talking early early 80s on that one that's crazy okay so uh now you become so then you start doing these uh radio shows you were still mix master mike when you when you got on these two stations i was still mix master mike at that point and uh even when i was in my uh in the club after i left the uh skating rink because i started the skating rink after i left the, the skating rink i went to this club called new york times man it had to be 83 i want to say and uh started DJing in the club and I was still mix master Mike at that point. But then the owner of the club and uh, the owner's son was a, was the DJ in the club as well. So he kind of brought me in and um, I was still mix master, but they started calling me magic. Mm. And, uh, and, you know, back then I was like, don't call me magic. That ain't my name. My name mix master, you know? So I was, I was sticking with my name, Yeah. but then because they called me magic, everybody else started calling me magic. So, and then one day I asked him, I said, why are you calling me magic? And so then he said, because of the way I work the table. So, so he said, it looks like magic with what, what I was doing. So he said, you need to change your name to magic. You know, so I said, you know what? I might as well change my name to magic because that's what everybody's calling me anyway. So at that point, I switched my name from Mixed Master to Magic Mike, probably 84, 85. And the rest is history with that one. Mm, that's interesting. So people yeah. tell, telling us to ask you about DJ Snake, but we'll get into that a little later. Snake, 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 snake. DJ Snake. Uh, Are they talking about the big I know, snake? I know, I know a lot of snakes. Um, DJ Snake. I don't know that one. You got me on that one. And Lamar I can't, Lamar, and I can't Lamar read Lamar because it's uh, yeah, too small. Got Lamar, me on that Lamar one. asking about that one. So let's see. Okay. All right, cool. So now, can you talk to us about how Willie D was so pinnacle in, in these early days? <sighs> well, Willie D was the PD at the radio station. Mm. And um, so with him kind of taking me under his wing and making me like the DJ for the station, because back then they didn't have mixed shows on the radio, you know, so he just kind of would take things that I would do. You know, I would have to record it and give it to him and naturally, you know, we get approved and, and then we'll go on the air. But back then we didn't really have to worry about, you know, explicit lyrics and all that other stuff back then. So it just had to kind of fit the format of the station. But he liked what I was doing club wise. So what wound up happening is we would do like Friday night in the mix, Saturday night in the mix, you know, and then for an hour or two hours, he would just play my mixes on the radio station. And then he started doing the skating rink. You know, he was already doing the skating rink at that point. And so I was at the skating rink. So it just almost because he brought me into the skating rink as well. So it was just almost like a marriage made in heaven at that point. Nice. So yeah. he, was, he was pinnacle. Yeah, that's great that he put you on. He kind of started started my career back then. That's awesome. That's a great mentor. So, um, 
So what happened? What about uh, uh, royalty? What was it? Uh, Billy Love on the Billy radio. Love. Oh, Billy Love. She was she was also a DJ at the radio station, and uh, may she rest in peace. She was a good good lady too, but um, she kind of took me and my first MC from back then. This was eighty five, and you know, got us in the studio and started you know doing demos, and you know, and then she also was um right under Jack the Rapper. I don't know if you remember Jack the Rapper or not. But he used to do uh, like a family affair in Atlanta. Uh, okay. this, this was in the 90s, but it was all through the 70s and 80s as well. But she worked with him. So she kind of took us under her wing and started managing us and, uh, you know, trying to get the demo out and all that. But needless to say, that that wound up not really going anywhere. You know, so I, I was still at the radio station. And at that point, you know, I was in college. And, you know, because then at that point, you know, hip hop was just kind of getting you know getting this foundation we're talking mid 80s at that point mm -hmm. you know it was just starting to find you know get get grips through florida and um so i was still in college and you know still also djing and then the royal posse was also part of deaf royalty which was the name of the first group so hence where royal posse came from because we got rid of deaf royalty because he and i kind of parted ways and because we wasn't getting anywhere with what we wanted to do Mm -hmm. And then we started, I kept Royal Posse going. And so hence the first album was DJ Magic Mike and the Royal Posse. Wow. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about the music scene in the O though? Because I think that's really important to, for people to get the context. So early days, like wh what was the scene like in Orlando? Like, did they have their wow. own scene? Did they have their own? Um, no, not really. We, we really didn't have music per se for Orlando. Mm -hmm. You know, like Orlando has always been like a giant melting pot, you know, so we kind of listen to music from everywhere because, you know, we get a melting pot of people here, you know, because we're a tourist mecca. So even back then, it's like, you know, we we didn't kind of we didn't stereotype nothing. We liked everything. So we played the West Coast, whether it was Egyptian lover or, you know, or moving on up, you know, to, you know, easy and NWA. It, it didn't matter. We liked New York, you know, from the mid 80s. So. You know, whether it was Beastie Boys or Run DMC and LL, we liked all that. But we didn't really have anything huge in Florida at that point. You know, everything was just really starting to come up at that point. So, like, we had, you know, MC80, um, we had Shadi, um, you know, but this was this was all early-ish, you know. And then 2 Live started, I want to say, 84 with 2 Live and then What I Like. And then Throw the D probably came the end of 85. So that was when everything was really kind of starting for us. So we we were a melting pot. So we we liked everything and we played everything. That's great. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what do you think all those influences like? How did that uh, get into you? Because I love that story when you talk about you went to a a store, you ended up buying the eight hundred eight. You just started messing that with was, it. You know that was an eighty five. I went to this uh went to this store called uh, actually still in that store is still open too. Discount Music Center. And uh, walked in, and I used to go in there and mess with mess with you know equipment, turntables, and whatever. And they had this 808 sitting there, and I knew nothing really about drum machines at that point. But I knew I went to, and I was just gravitated to it. I went to it and turned it on and started messing with it. And as soon as I hit play, somebody already had a beat in it, and I sat there and I listened to it. I'm like, oh, this is where everybody's doing this. You know, this is where it's coming from, and it just sounded good to me. So I knew that point I needed that drum machine. So I had to kind of save a little money. And get you know get my funds together, and then and I wound up buying that eight you know buying the eight hundred eight. And talk to us a little bit about um, so for you guys that aren't uh, familiar with it, eight hundred eight to old school. Rolling, old, rolling old drum drum yeah. Yeah. yeah, I hope I hope everybody's familiar with the eight hundred eight. <laughs> they, they actually made a great documentary no. about it. I don't know if you did you get to see it. Um, I didn't see it. No, a couple people told me about it, but I didn't see it. Yeah, so 808 was one of the ones where they they kind of fell short because it didn't sound like a drum. Like 707 had a little more, you know, this, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then the 808 kind of for for what it was, they said fell short, but uh, ended up being something they stopped making. I think they only made a certain amount, and then the uh, yeah. the transistors. I mean, I'm gonna get geeky, so I'll stop talking about. But they ran into some transistor in it, and they stopped making it, and that's when it became like all of a sudden all these people started using it. Mm -hmm. And it became the big thing. And the 808 sound is so uh Yeah. Especially the bass music, right? Oh yeah, big time. 
bass music. I like if I if I didn't have my 808, there wouldn't be no boom. There you go. So yeah. tell us a little bit how you you started messing with it and you started doing things with the swing and making it do things that it wasn't. Well, even- well people with the 808, they didn't know that you can kind of get into it and you know do swing patterns and all kinds of weird beats on it. You know, so I would do beats on that machine, but then people would swear that I didn't use that 808 you know, for that kind of a beat. And I'm like, you just have to learn the machine. But that's that's me though. Like I like to get into things and 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 see how they, you know, see how they tick. You know, it's like I don't just turn something on. I want to realize what it does and learn every aspect of it. And so that's what I did with that, you know, because I would hear like, you know, like Mantronic beats, you know, back then. I'm like, how did he do this? You know, and I know he was using 808, couldn't figure it out, you know. And then all of a sudden, I started putting two and two together and figured out how to do all kinds of weird beats on the, on the machine, and uh, that that kind of led to my career at that point because when I started doing those kind of beats is what led to feel the bass, which was huge for me on my first album. But that kind of led me into a different you know a different path. Mm. So. Did once you mess with the 808, was this right around the time you were going to the studio with your rapper? Um, yes, it was actually actually at the exact same time when I was uh because this was still all 85, 85, 86. Yeah, so it was exactly the same time. Got it. When now, how many did, did you guys put out demos or how, what we, did, we did quite a few demos actually, and uh they just didn't, you know, didn't do anything, didn't go, you know. Who knows, you know, for whatever reason, you know, but I will tell you a funny story, though. Um, back then, this was um, she was still managing us. And I I didn't want to believe that no one liked what we were doing. You know, it was just hard for me to believe. So what I did is and I, I'm not going to say what label was, but it was a major label mm-hmm. and uh, got a demo tape together and sent them you know, sent the demo tape out like she asked me to, but they, and they sent a letter back saying that they, they got the demo tape and they listened to it, but you know, it wasn't what, you know, wasn't, wasn't the direction that they were going in and uh, wasn't what they were looking for at the time. But you know, if uh, we did anything else to submit it, you know, submit it later on. Well, what I didn't tell my manager at that point was the tape that I sent them was blank. There was nothing on it. No way. Yeah. There was nothing on the tape. So when I, when that happened, I realized I'm like these people aren't even listening to the music. Yeah. So when I realized that, that actually helped me feel better about things because I'm like, I know my music is not bad. So I'm like, why are they not giving us, mm. you know, a deal or you know, or whatever? So when that happened, I said, okay, now I understand what's going on. Mm, that's interesting. Wow, mm-hmm. that's crazy to to even think. So what gave you the instinct to just say, uh, send a blank tape? Because I, I got sick of getting letters back saying that it wasn't what they were looking for. And I'm like, well, what are you looking for? You know, like, because it kind of fits everything that was going on at the time. Mm-hmm. You know, so it made no sense to me that, you know, it wasn't what you were looking for because it fits what was going on at the time. So that was why I did that with the, you know, with the tape. And then when I told my manager, she says, OK, she says, you're too smart for your own good. I was like, well, maybe so. But I wanted to see what was going on. But it, it, it actually made me feel better about what was going on. That's good. Now, how long uh, after that did you end up in Miami? Can you tell us that little transition? So from oh. were you still in the radio station? So how did how did it evolve into I, the, the I was still, radio station? I, I was still at the radio station at that point. Um, the radio station had this had like a like a party at the fairground and they brought, you know, brought artists in. And this was 80, had to be 1987. And they brought uh, different artists in, you know, to perform and everything. And then uh, Clay D showed up. And when Clay D showed up uh, from Miami, he he came, but he didn't have a DJ. But I was the DJ for the radio station. So I was playing the music in between, you know, the groups. And so he kind of looked at me and he, and he said, man, he says, I don't have a DJ to play my music. You know, can you, you know, play these songs right here and play them in order for me? So I said, oh, I got you, man. You know, so I went on and... Um, so I, one of the songs he had, I knew, you know, and uh, a couple of them I didn't, but I guess they were big in Miami, but we, we weren't playing them in Orlando. And uh, so I kind of, I hooked him up, you know, and I kind of made him sound good while he was on stage, you know, and so kind of hooked him up and everything went well. So then 
he came and asked me, he said, you want to, you want to come on the road with me? You know, he's getting ready to go on a, a tour with two live and, uh, he needed a DJ and I'm like, no, nah, I'm not interested in that. I, you know, because at that point I was like, I'm well into college at that point and I'm doing other things. And, and, uh, so he was like, okay. He says, well, he says, I'm also working on a project in Miami mm-hmm. and said, um, even if you don't want to do the tour, he says, come down and work with me on the project and, you know, never know what could happen. So when he said that, I'm like, you know what, I've been trying to get myself together and try to figure out what's going on musically right now. So I said, let's, let me try that, you know? And so then uh, I took his number and then a couple of days, you know, we, we talked and then I told him, all right, I'm going to come down. So he said, I'll come get you. So I said, okay, cool. So he came out of Atlanta, picked me up and uh, we went back to Miami and uh, we started recording. And then that was the cool rock and Chaz album, the boot, the booty album. That's such a big record. Yeah. So funny. Yeah. It was huge. Yeah. It was huge. <laughs> we were talking about that and I'm like, and you're like, yeah, the song. And, and as we were talking about it, you sang it. I was like, wait a minute. And we started doing some research on it. I'm like, wow, this song was like pivotal to that moment, like that that time. Yeah. That's amazing. Guys, big shout out to DJ Zog. We see you in here. Shout out to Miami, DJ Zog. We got so many other people in here. Michael Brooks, Wayne Winstead, Jared, what's up? Jason Hicks, Kyle, how are you? K Dog, Desmond Williams, shout out to DJ Des, Tampa in the building. I know Des, what up, Des? <laughs> he says, blessed to know this legend. There we go. Chris Jones, how are you? Michael Brooks. Uh, okay, so really quickly, guys, I want to make sure you share. I know we got hundreds of people watching. If you get one share each, we'll get this uh, information to the as many people as possi- uh, possible. We want to get uh, be respectful of uh, Mike, Magic Mike's time. All right, so now you get to this point. Um, you start. You do start uh, helping them out, right? And then, yeah. can you share with us when they asked you to go to Miami and start working on some records? Um, well, that was the whole situation with Clay when he came and got me, and then we went down. Mm-hmm. And uh, started, you know, then we did the Cool Rock and Chaz album. And uh, that album went, did really, really, really well. But still, in the back of my mind, I'm still thinking, you know, let's let's do something, you know. And um, so Clay and I pretty much started doing shows together at that point. Mm. Uh, I stopped, stopped school, naturally. You were in college uh, at the time? I was at college at the time. Okay. Um, we stopped school. And just kind of stayed. So I was more so in Miami at that point than Orlando um, because we were just, it was just a lot going on. And then uh, Cool Rock and Chaz, they, we kind of let them do their own thing. They had their own thing. And then Clay, Clay and I started doing our own thing. And then I brought in Prince Raheem, which was my rapper from Orlando. When he was in the Royal Posse, but I took him with me to Miami. And then, uh, so then Clay and I, we did a song called Rock the House. And that was like our first solo song. And then I put Raheem on the song to kind of bring him out to make it a group, you know? And so then we, Clay, Clay, Raheem and I, we started working on, you know, on our first album. But that album, I wound up leaving the group uh, before they could release the album. And they wound up releasing the album anyway. And took my name off of it even though i helped produce the whole album yeah well paying dues, paying dues you live and learn you know and uh you know so but you know the rest is history i say because that kind of pushed me into being my own person at that point because i'm like okay this won't happen again mm-hmm. you know so you live you learn you and you you know you move with it you know mm-hmm. Uh, so Rodney Allen asks, was there ever an SP-1200 ever used in Magic Mike records? Yes, the SP-1200 came, actually the 1200 came on the first album, the DJ Magic Mike and the Royal Posse album. That was that was 808 and 1200 um, on that first album. So yeah. Tell, tell them a little bit about the sampling time in an SP-1200. 10 seconds. <laughs> you got 10 seconds. So what you, what you wind up doing is you find a sample that you like, you have to put it on 45, mm-hmm. and then, you know, sample it on 45, and then you have to slow it back down. But then everybody liked that slow down ring sound, that you that little ring tone that they would always put on slow down samples. Yeah. And then that's where the grittiness came from, you know, the samples when you use the SP-1200. Like a lot of people still like that 12 bit sound to this day. Like a lot of people still use it, mm-hmm. you know, but yeah, it was, uh, we used the, actually the first, first album, the Royal Posse album we used, it was all, it was all 808 and uh, 1200. 
second album, basically the name of the game was, wait a minute, I'm thinking now. That was, actually, I put the 808 to the side on the second album, on, on basis name of the game. And it was uh, it was pretty much a sampler and an SP-1200 at that point. Hmm. Yeah. It's so it's so funny here in the comments. I think everyone on here, and I'm sure it's the same thing on Instagram. They're talking about how your speakers blew their systems or their <laughs> systems. So just so you know, I, we, already... did that. we did that on purpose. <laughs> you were definitely notorious for this. Yeah, man, we had to. There's a whole story behind how I feel about it, man. <laughs> so, uh, so tell tell us about it. Say, share share a little bit. Well, what wound up happening? This was eighty. This was when Drop the Bass came out in 88. And in, uh, in Orlando, everybody would take Drop the Bass and they started screwing it. And they would take it and, and start making making a drag song out of it. Well, at that point in time, I didn't like hearing my song like that. Mm. So I'm like, we made it for one way. And then all of a sudden, everybody, they're chopping it and screwing it. And so now it's just, so every car riding around playing Drop the Bass and it was dragging. So I talked to my engineer uh, when we were recording the album. And I said, listen, I said, I need to do a song that if they kind of take it and try to, you know, I want to do a chop and screw song, mm. but I want it already slow. But I said, I want it where if they slow it down anymore, it'll tear the speakers up. And so he's like, why would you want to do that? You know, I said, I, that's, I said, I'm pissed. I said, because I don't like what they're doing to my song. And uh, so <laughs> well, he says, okay. He says, let's plan something. He says, you get, get the music together. And he says, and we'll work on that end. So I said, okay, cool. So that, that was where Feel the Bass came from. So we got Feel the Bass in the studio and we started, you know, tracking it and then we got it. But then he put some kind of magic on that low end so that if you slowed, slowed it down any more than what it was already going, it would make the woofers move too much Ooh. and it would pop. And so and so that was why we called the song Speaker Terror Upper. Ooh. Yeah. And so and that's what wound up happening. So it became a cult at that point. And that was pretty much the first car audio bass song, you know, because that feel the bass started a whole genre of music afterwards. And that's not even what we were trying to do. So, you know, feel, I wound up having to do a new feel of bass with every album. No way. Do, do people know that story? Is that like one? Nah, uh, no, nah, most people don't know that story. <laughs> they know it now, though. They, they know it now. No, they, know it now. <laughs> they know it now. So DJ Zog asked, uh, do you, does he have a favorite old school bass song other than his own? Ooh. Um, now, what kind of bass song? Because that's that's multi genre. That's multi genre. Let yeah. us know, Zog. Let us know, Zog. All right. So, uh, Eric Brentley says, uh, Did the Beastie Boys ever have an issue with the mm drop sample? No, we're friends. Oh, you guys are not only not not only am I friends with them, but. Me and Russell Simmons are friends as well, so they didn't they didn't bother me. They didn't bother me. Okay. No, they they good. There we go. Okay, so uh, what I love is this next story. So now, what's funny is most people they hit a pinnacle part of their point, right? You're working on these records, you spend a lot of time in the studio. You move from the O to Miami, right? Or you were driving? Uh, no, we would. I was back and forth, and um, once we started Cheetah Records, it was I was probably in Miami. 70% of the time, you know, at that point. Um, but then I will always come home, but then it will always be something to do because the studio was it that we were uh, using that was in Melbourne. And then the, the manufacturer was in Miami. So we were kind of doing a 95 South North kind of situation back and forth, mm. you know? So I was not in Orlando a lot, but I would always come home like that. I wouldn't be gone, you know, more than two weeks at a time. Got it. So the be what I think sticks out here is the the fact that you're you're spending a lot of time in Miami. You're working on this album. It doesn't work out, right? You come back. They still put out the music. No, yeah. your name's not on it, right? Yeah. Uh, you took it as a lesson. But what was great was this next part. So now you how you linked up with someone. You had all these tracks. Yeah. Uh, the the thing is. Um, when we were recording the album, uh, I wanted to do a DJ song because back then on albums, every every you know every Miami song uh, album had you know DJ like Mega Mix, like Mr. Mix would have one and Jock D would have one, and I mean every every DJ the DJ man had one you know with Lawan and we would always listen you know listen for the DJ song. So I was working on a DJ song for Clay and I's album, and um, 
so we kept working on the song and the song just came out dope. But then when I decided to leave, I took my song with me. And so the song that I took with me was Magic White Cuts the Record. So brought it back to Orlando, gave it to a, a friend of mine uh, named CJ, uh, Kurt Creel. And he was running uh, UCF radio station at that time and gave him the song and he he liked it. So he played it off the cassette. And the, the request became so big that he had to wind up keep, you know, he had to play that song over and over again, like once an hour, like it became a rotated song, which then led to regular radio having to play the song as well in Orlando. And uh, a friend of mine, uh, who's no longer with us, Jimmy Jams, he was working at uh, another radio station, which was 102 at that point. And uh, he told me, he says, I have a friend that has a, a record label. So he said, you know, uh, the record label's not doing well. You know, he's not, he doesn't know what to do with it. But he says, let me introduce you and see what can happen. You know, he's like, who knows? He's like, you need to get this record out. So I said, okay. And uh, he introduced, you know, me to the guy or whatever. And that was the president of the Cheetah Records at that point. And uh, we, you know, made a deal, you know, for the song or whatever. And we worked everything together. And then we wound up going, going ahead and putting the song out. So, so with these tracks, you end up having an album too, right? Or was it just a single? Well, when we did, when we did Magic Mike Custer Record, it was just the one song. Okay. And, um, you know, because that was all, that was all we were really concerned about. We weren't, weren't even trying to go towards, you know, trying to do a deal, you know, per se for an album. But Magic Mike Custer Record, the single was so big that we had to go into another, another song. So what wound up happening is my boy MC Boo, he was still in the Royal Posse as well. And so we had already had to drop the bass demo ready to go. And so he heard drop the bass. And so he's like, this is a good follow-up song for that. So I'm like, okay, well, let's put it out. So then we wound up putting out drop the bass about two months after Magic Mike cuts the record. And so that's why both of those songs were huge at the exact same time, but we still didn't have an album. And then because of those being huge is when we decided let's get together and we need to do something to try to get an album out because that was where the money was at. The money wasn't in singles at that time. So yeah. then we got together and we did Roy Posse album in probably five, about four or five days, Ooh. you know, got in and, you know, but I I was working with talented people. Thank God they, you know, I had the beats, they had them, you know, they had the, the rhymes and we just got together and just kind of knocked it out, you know, and then we got the album done. And I want to say within a week, we got that album done and two weeks had the artwork, everything was ready to go. And this was the beginning, this was probably summer, the beginning of the summer of 89, and then the Royal Posse album came out in August of 89. So we we hurried up and got that thing out. Now, this is an interesting story, especially with the two songs being out at the same time. But share with us how uh, the, the record industry, RIAA, and uh, the gold and the platinum, well, I think it was yeah. the gold first, right? It was it was gold first, and um, we didn't know that the record had sold as much as it had sold. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the account executives that we had for Cheetah, he told us the numbers. He says, you know, you you sold over you know half a million records with you know with this album, and we're like, really? You know, we we couldn't believe it. You know, we just didn't think nothing about it. But that this also wasn't with the. Uh, what the first album because we didn't have him on the first album we didn't bring him in until after the first album going into the second album so actually what wound up happening is the second album wound up going gold first mm. um so we counted and did you know did the accounting and then we said okay well let's try to certify it you know see what happens you know we didn't know the, the ropes to go and uh got in contact with riaa you know to get it certified so we can get you know get it certified you know we want to you know I mean, that was huge. And then because we were just a small label, they didn't want to believe that we had, you know, we had sold those amount of records. They they wouldn't believe it. And so needless to say, he kept harping on like, OK, well, what do we need to do? We've sold this amount of records. We need, you know, we need to get this certified. So they said, we're going to send somebody to your company to physically count the numbers and, and go through the records to see if that album had gone gold and sure enough, they sent somebody in and they sat with him and uh, counted and counted and counted. And uh, this can't be, you know, this can't be real. And sure enough, they, they counted and they found out that it had sold over 500, but that was my second album, basically the name of the game. So after that had happened, 
we realized, well, wait a minute, the first album sold more than the second album. Mm. So they went back uh, after they had left. We went back and counted the numbers for the first album. And it was it was over a million at that point. And so then we call them back and say, uh, you need to check these two because this one has sold, you know, more numbers than the first one. And so then they just said, send us the papers so we can, you know, verify it. And we sent it to them and the rest was history. So that was how the first album wound up going platinum and then the second one gold. But then everything else after that for the next probably three or four albums wound up going gold as well. What's amazing about this story, guys, is this is independently. So yeah, it was all independent. <laughs> there was a lot of work. And yeah. one of the things that really stood out to me was how he was talking about how there were work records. And I'm like, oh, did you have a radio promotions person? Did you have a this person? They were like, no, it was us. No, we were... <laughs> <that's> us. <laughs> so no. uh, can you imagine? And and the leg, it wasn't, we're not talking about streaming here, guys. We're talking about actually physically sending these out to distributors, them putting out on record stores, selling. So there's a lot of moving parts to get to that. But, well, even with the first album, we weren't even, we didn't even have distributors because the first album, we were driving it around the record stores doing consignments. Mm. And then because of the consignments being so big, it's how the first one-stop Bassin, it was uh, a one-stop in Miami. I don't know if they still there or not, but it was called Bassin Distributors. Mm. They got in contact with us because of the numbers that we were selling in, you know, independently in the stores, but we were just driving them around. You know, every Friday we would drive, take new albums, pick up, you know, pick up cash. And that was how everything got started, you know. So with Bassin, with them being the one stop, they took it and then they had the power to get it a little bit further. And then, you know, when you get into another area, then you start getting into Atlanta. So then that was a different one stop. And so that was how we wound up, you know, circumventing the, the whole U.S. by just going through one stops all, you know, everywhere. I love that. So shout out to Stacy Taylor. That's one of our gurus on here. She said you could work records regionally back then. Shout out yeah. to her. Yeah. So uh, she's worked with a lot of big, big artists. Mm -hmm. uh, that's interesting, though. But what's crazy is that you guys really just learned as you went because it's not yeah. like Peter you know, Records had this ridiculous, ex uh, you know, uh, nah, it was, extensive knowledge it, with records. No, that it was all up, man. All up. Yeah. So um, now, Quick side question, but how many records did you press at a time back then? So, um, when we did the Royal Posse album, it was all I want to say we did initially 10,000. Um, we did, uh, yeah, the first album we did 10,000, and then it was all every time we would take them around, it would be, and we have to get new ones manufactured, it was always in, in uh, 10,000 allotments, Got but it. then once the distributor. Uh, the one stop picked it up then we had to kind of up the numbers because they needed more you know so then that's when you kind of say well do you want to take all this money and put it in there to take the chance or do you want to just kind of leave it and we just said forget it just put put the money in and go run with it and that was what we did so that was it so all the money you made you reinvested right away and no. put it right back into it yeah that's amazing that's good that's definitely it's talking about reinvesting this is good mm -hmm. Guys, we got hundreds of hundreds of people watching. You got to make sure you all share. We're trying to break the internet with uh, DJ Magic Mike, which he always does. He does with his streams and everything else. So we want to make sure that everybody hears his story. So make sure you share, share, share. Uh, also, if you guys hang out, we're also going to give you guys a, a free T-shirt, KPO DJ. Uh, we'll, we'll select the winner by the end of the day. So uh, DJ Zog, I want to kind of get into that. So he said uh, that he's asking about, let's see one second. I want to find it really quickly. I think he's he's talking about the like two live crew days, the 87, 85. Who was your favorite right around that time? Ooh, um, it was probably it was probably two live at that point because um that was who we had as a as a marker, you know, that's who we had to kind of follow, you know. But um yeah, I was but I liked all Miami based though. I mean, it didn't, you know, whether it was Cooley C or I mean I I liked a lot I liked a lot of Miami bass like I still like Miami bass a lot um but back then it was probably too live like I want to say like I want to say head booty and cock is probably my favorite two live song mm. I don't I don't get to play it a lot but that's probably one of my favorites um he put down Danny D African two live etc from 87 to 91 wow yeah that was, uh, it's it's kind of hard to put it in, you know, just say well one over the other, 
Yeah. Because, I mean, it was a there was a lot of Miami Bay songs I liked. So you can it, but the, the genre was huge through Florida back then. So I mean, you go to a party and that was all you would hear, you know, whether you hearing Poison Ivy or uh, I mean, it was just it was a lot. It was just a lot of Miami based songs that we liked, you know, and they and they all rocked, you know. So now once you had these records, this is a really interesting story, too. Right. So you're putting out these records, doing all this stuff. What was happening with your live performances? Like, how was that translating, you know, records live? And I love how you were talking about eventually we'll get to. But once you got to the West Coast, so let's get into well, that. through the Southeast, we were great. Um <laughs> You know, because we had no issues, you know, traveling anywhere in the southeast, whether it was the Carolinas or, you know, Alabama, all the way over to, you know, New Orleans. You know, we were always in Atlanta. Um, like we was in Atlanta a lot, you know, all through Florida. But we knew that records were selling outside of of that area. But we didn't have a booking agent that could get us into the other, you know, to the other areas. So we had the southeast covered um like detroit was huge for us but we couldn't we couldn't get to detroit because we didn't know the right people or the right places to to get us or the right people to get us into the right place up there and so then finally we we tackled the midwest um detroit grand rapid chicago everything everything up there it was just huge and uh, we finally got up into the midwest by finding a, a booking agent that would bring us up there. And so we did like a Midwest tour. Um, but we still, and like, we couldn't get, so it was like a straight line from Texas, Dallas, straight up, you know? So everything east of that, we were great. Everything west of that, we were selling a lot of records, but we couldn't get in mm -hmm. uh, to do shows. And um, went to Seattle one time, uh, did great in Seattle, oh, did real good in Seattle. Mm -hmm. uh, did a show there, um, and I wanted to come down the state, but we couldn't, uh, you know, come from and then go through, you know, Oregon and, and come through Cali because mm -hmm. Bay Area, we were huge too, but we just could not get shows on the West Coast. And then uh, what wound up happening, we went to a car show out in, uh, out in California. I want to say it was L.A. I want to say it was L.A., but now that I'm thinking about it, it might have been San Diego. Mm-hmm. It was one of them. I'm getting old now, so it's kind of hard to remember that. But um, we did a we did a car show out there, and we had never been to the West Coast, so it they marketed it that you know we were coming, and uh, you know we did the car show and and all of this, and they did this. I mean, the car show was huge. I mean, they told us if you know from anywhere from five to ten thousand people will be at this car show. So I'm like, okay, that's that's good for us. You know, we could go and, you know, take some pictures and, you know, meet some people, make some new fans or whatever. And then they asked us if we wanted to perform at the car show. So I was like, yeah, we'll do a show out there. You know, so then we did the show at the car show, but what wound up happening, I want to say it was 20,000 people ended up at this show because we had never been there, you know, and everybody knew, you know, knew the music and we were huge, but we could, we had never been there. So then once we did that show, that opened up you know, the whole West Coast for us, you know, but we couldn't get a booking agent. We couldn't get anything out, you know, in that way. But then once that happened, then they were calling for us, you know, and then we, that opened it up for us at that point. What was crazy was because you guys were there, that car show was packed. It was packed, mean? yeah. So it was like, that was your concert without it being official. Right, yeah, official, right. Because they said, you know, 5,000, they said maybe 10,000 people. But when 20,000 people ended up at this car show, they everybody was just tripping. But that was that was a fun trip. That's amazing. These are great, great stories. What I love is the, the, just the legwork. I mean, there was a lot of legwork stuff going on. Did you guys even know what you were doing, or was it just something that it was all luck? <laughs> really? all luck. Yeah, it was all luck. Crazy luck, but, luck, and being blessed. Luck and being blessed. What I love though is you guys were putting in the work. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. When you were positioned, it was like going. But but I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Yeah. It wasn't like you had this plan. No, right? no, no, no. It wasn't planned, but. You know, once we got, you know, into the 90s, you know, 92, 93, 94, you know, and during that time, well, then now we have a staff, you know, so now we got people that kind of know what they're doing. And then so now when we release an album, then it's, you know, it it's a different, it comes out, it's a different level. It's a prelude before it's promotions, it's all that before the album came out, whereas before we didn't have any of that, you know. 
So we were just like, okay, the album's out, you know, go get it, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And um, you know, we do some, you know, a couple ads and a couple magazines or whatever, and you know, and that was pretty much it. That was great. And a, a lot of word of mouth, right? A lot, a lot, of, of, a lot of word of mouth, yeah. A lot of calls. Yeah. All right. We got uh, Joshua uh, Petra t- says, uh, what's your favorite break beat song you like to mix? Oh, that's hard because with breaks, I usually do my own remixes. Um, I have a lot. Um, wow. They're hitting you with the hard ones today. Yeah, that's a hard one there. Um, <laughs> First one that comes to mind. How about that? First one that comes to mind. Scram, Plump DJs. There you go. Yeah, good All right. Enough. Uh, how, ask him. Uh, William Hernandez says, "Ask him how did he go about choosing records to scratch? Also, was there any friendly competition with Mister Mix from Two Live Crew?" <laughs> yeah, that was it. Well, the way that I met Mix, it wasn't friendly at all. Mm. Um, this I met Mix in 1986, and this was after the peak of Throw the D and everything was huge. Well, Two Live Crew. Luke and Two Live came to Orlando to do a, a concert. And uh, I couldn't go to the concert because we had a club at the time downtown called Electric Avenue. Well, Electric Avenue was, that was my club. That was my spot, you know? So everybody knew me for being Electric Avenue. So I don't care what's going on in Orlando at the time, Electric Avenue was just gonna be packed. So what wound up happening is Two Live Crucial wasn't as packed as it should have been. And then they found out it was because of me being at Electric Avenue. Now, keep in mind, my name was just local at that point because I had nothing out. Mm. So um, Luke and Mr. Mix decided to show up to Electric Avenue. And uh, <laughs> he brought Mr. Mixon to the club to battle me live, you know, unbeknownst to me. So I'm like, really? I'm like, you going to come come to my spot to do this? And he came in uh, and we had like a live battle in front of everybody. And I just destroyed him. It, oh. it was it wasn't pretty at all. And um, so Mr. Mix didn't like me because Luke pushed him up to that, you know. So for the beginning of our careers, you know, he just didn't like me. But that was his fault. It wasn't my fault, you know. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I mean, we friends now. We good now. And uh, even once I got to Miami, we started recording. He and I became we, we were real cool, you know, at that point. But I had not animosity. But when I when I went to Miami and I started recording, my whole thing was to not sound like Mr. Mix, mm. like, you know what I mean? Because I'm old school, you know, like back then everybody had their own style, okay. you know, we all knew Mix's style, you know, and mine was a little bit more complicated, a little bit more complex. You know, I, I like turntable and stuff. I like cutting, you know, so that was my thing. So I'm like, okay, when I start doing these records, I'm not going to sound like Mr. Mix, you know? So, and that was the whole thing, but yeah, we, we didn't, we didn't see eye to eye at first, but yeah, we, we cool now though. That's good. That's good. Uh, let's see one second. Uh, are there any funny competition? We did that. Mr. Mix. There's another guy they're asking about wh- who was part of them. Was DJ Toomp? T-O-O-O. Oh, my and boy. Yeah. yeah. They were asking if you guys crossed paths. So I guess you guys knew each other. Uh, Toomp, well, Toomp and I became real good friends. Like, um, Toomp, I kind of owe a lot to Toomp, too, because I want to say 90. Ooh, this might be 80. No, it was like 90, 91. Like Toop and I was already friends anyway. I met him like back in the Miami days because um Shy, he he was Shadi's DJ and him and Mike Fresh became Shadi's DJ after uh DJ Man left him. Well I met Shadi in 85. So it was just almost like a mutual thing. So that was how you know I, I knew Toop. But Toop and I hit it off when we first met each other. But I I want to say 90, either 90 or 91, I hit like a like a serious DJ writer's block mm-hmm. and couldn't, and I uh, couldn't like my mind wasn't working DJ wise. Like I could still produce, but DJ wise, my mind wasn't working. And I talked to Toop about it and Toop came down, came down to my house, man. And we sat up in here and he kind of got, got my mind back right as far as DJing. Like he stayed here for a while. And uh, so I kind of owe him a lot when it comes to that, because, you know, it was a, uh, it was a different kind of thing for me because I hadn't really experienced that. But 1991, we were working so much that, you know, I went from practicing every day, you know, because that's what you do, you know, as a DJ. And then I got to the point that I couldn't practice every day because it was other things that had to be taken care of. Mm. And uh, he came down and was like, no, nah, we ain't going to let this happen. 
you know, and he came down and he, he, he whipped me back and got me back. Right. You know, so. That's a great story. That's yeah, man. But yeah, to went on to become, uh, you know, legendary for the most part. And that's a great thing, you know, producing for TI and Kanye and, and everybody else. So big shout out to him, man. Love that dude. That's great. So is this guy, uh, so William Hernandez asked, uh, when did, ask him how he hooked up with Cubert and the Scratch Pickles. I met Cubert uh, during New Music Seminar. Um, wow, I'm showing my age now for real. <laughs> um, when did they do New Music Seminar? It had to be mid 90s. Wow, going back. But I met them, I met Cubert first. Um, but then Cubert, when I met him, Cubert, he looked at me. I, he looked at me like like I was his idol, and uh, and I wasn't. That just kind of tripped me out. And then talking to him once I met him in New York at the at the seminar, he said that all they did was mimic my scratches. They said they would put you know put music on and listen to them and listen to them, and and that was how they got their speed and listening to the cuts. And so from then on, like we've been friends ever since. You know, so it's like we talking early 90s, early, and then um, Shortcut did a song with me for my Magic's Kingdom album. This was 2000. Um, you know, finally we did a song together and then finally Cuba did my Journey in the Scratching song, which was uh, eight years ago, seven, seven or eight years ago, me, him, and Craze. You know, but we've we've always been friends too. So, that's yeah, that's, yeah, that's the, that's the whole Cuba thing. That's the whole Cuba. We just had a uh, Latin Prince on. He said that him and Cuba went to high school. Wow. You know Latin Prince from the back. Yeah, I know, yeah, I know Prince. Yeah, so he used, uh, with, he used to be with Ness back in the day. Nasty Ness, and Ness Ness was with Mix a lot. So that was Nasty, and then Mix Nasty Mix Records. So that's where that came from. But yeah, he used to be with Ness back in the day. So Sean Jr. asks, is it still weird to hear your songs on the radio today? So funny because you just posted that uh, Magic Mike cuts the record. You posted that like a week and a half, two weeks ago. Yeah, sometimes it is. It, it depends on if I'm expecting it. You know, like if you're like sometimes if I'm driving in the car and I'm listening to Rock the Bells radio, well, I kind of know they play my music. So it's it's kind of expected. But then when you're just in the car and it just comes on out of the blue, you don't. I, it just kind of like wow, okay, wow, and you just shake your head, and just smile, you know. Now I don't, not used to it because we were never huge with radio per se, you know. So uh, yeah, nah. That's good. All yeah. right, guys, we're gonna actually start giving away some stuff in a second. We're gonna give away a T-shirt and we're gonna put you guys in the drawing for the uh, streaming stuff. So make sure you share, share, share. This way, your friends get to uh, see it as well. Also. Respect to uh, DJ Magic Mike who's giving, dropping some gems here, and he's answering your questions. So we want we want him to answer. So uh, Jason Remington Steele says, any songs that he's remixed that our original artists heard and loved the remix? Oh yeah, and uh, what a Remington! I know him. Uh, <laughs> one of my boys. Yeah, big time. Um, but the main one that comes to mind is Planet Rock. When I did the Planet Rock remix, um, I talked to Bam about it because I needed to get his blessings. You know, because I knew that it was weirdness going on between him and Tommy Boy and all of that, you know, when they did those remixes. Mm -hmm. And um, he he said that my remix was the only one in that whole compilation that he loved because I kept it true to the original mm. and just added flavor to it versus taking the whole song and changing it. You know, and so that was uh, you had no idea because what that meant to me because planet rock was the basis of bass music back then you know i mean that's you know you listen to a planet rock beat and that's where miami bass was you know where it came from you know so for him to say that to me it just it meant a lot so yeah planet rock africa bambata there you go there you go that's the answer so uh steve tass have you ever thought of ever doing a song on a song with another orlando legend dj icy I asked Icy to do a song with me because I'm working on a, a project right now. And I asked Icy to do a song with me. And he says, yeah, 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 we can do it. And then uh, I reached out to him and he didn't reach back. So I'll reach out once and that's it. And if you don't reach back, then we keep it moving. You know, so I tried to I tried to do a song with Icy. Well, we'll if he reach out to me and we can knock it out before this project is done, then cool. We'll get it done. There you go. OK, cool. So your guy, DJ Rincon, asked, what was your most satisfying DJ battle? Ooh, well, I've had a lot. 
Um, it will probably be the Mr. Mix one because those that you don't anticipate and you and you're not practicing for and you just kind of get you know spur, you know blown on like that it's uh it's more satisfying when you can bust somebody up you know and it's not something that you plan i mean we you know i did the dmc battles you know back in the 90s early 90s and all that and you know those you you prepare for you know you plan for for months you know but you know, you're in a club and then somebody show up with, you know, with some records and, you know, let's go. You know, that those are more satisfying to me. That's good. That's good. Yeah. So Ben Moon says, can you please convince Infinity to start producing breaks again? <sighs> Infinity is uh, Scott is Scott. And we'll leave it at that. He I tried. I, I tried. And. I can't say nothing about Scott. I love Scott, but uh, <laughs> uh, Scott will work on music when when Scott wants to work on music. He's his head is in you know different places right now, so I don't think it's getting ready to happen. Mm, that's honest. That's good. Yeah. So Michael Brooks says, "Have you ever thought about participating in any hip hop lectures, kind of like Ninth Wonder?" Um. Not really. Um, just never, never. Mm -mm. I I don't even really have an answer for that. No, they if if people reach out, like I've done some. Um, if people reach out to me, then I usually don't have a problem, you know, doing it. But people kind of don't reach out, you know, for that. Not not realizing that that we got a serious history down here, you know. So it's a lot to learn, but people don't reach out. So if they don't reach out, then I'm not going to reach out to them and say, Hey, I want to be on your, you know, because I got better things to do with my time, mm -hmm. you know? So if people want to learn something, you know, or they want me to tell them something or teach them something, then I'm, then I'm for it. But if they don't reach out and, and ask then it won't happen. That's honest. I love that. Yeah. Uh, so guy Masterson says, how did you get into breaks? Um, yeah. <laughs> That's that's an easy and hard question. Um, I, my whole breakbeat career, I owe to one person, and his name is DJ Sandy. Uh, all my breakbeat people that's on the feed right now, they they will know who Sandy is. I owe him the world, and I and I'll tell you why. Um, 96, 96, 97, um, bass music took a really ugly nasty death like mm -hmm. it like it died um there were too many people that infiltrated the music you know that just kind of messed the whole genre of music up so bass music died like it just it was it was not a slow death it just died mm -hmm. and um at that point i'm like okay well what do i do now you know and um, right on the cusp of it getting ready to die, I did like two albums with a friend of mine named Patrick, Ted Master P.E.B. And uh, we did those. And I did one more album uh, for their label. And it just died an ugly death. So at that point, I'm like, OK, what do I do now? And um, I'm like, well, back to school I go, you know, and uh, try to figure something else out. Well, I met Sandy. And I met Sandy through uh, Jimmy Joslin. And Sandy kind of took me under his wing. Uh, he was playing. Sandy was just traveling and playing everywhere and doing all kinds of stuff. And um, he came to me. And he says, man, he says, everyone loves you. He's like, you need to get out and start spinning, start DJing. And I'm still not understanding what he meant by that. And uh, he says, I'm playing at this place in Jacksonville. I'll never forget it. He says, I'm playing at this place in Jacksonville called Club Five. He says, I want to bring you with me. He says, if you want to get on and play, you can. He says, if not, I just want you to experience this. So I said, okay. So I went with him and Jimmy, and we all went up to Club Five. And when I go in, it's, uh, it's, it was a culture shock because I was, a bass, I was a bass dude, a bass music DJ, and now I'm being thrown into the EDM world, mm. you know, which was breaks. And I'm looking around, and I'm like, wow, this is, this is kind of crazy. And I'm um, listening to the music. I'm like, well, it's not really what I'm into, you know, but I like it, you know. And so then um, 
the owner uh, came up to me that night and everybody was happy that I was there. And he came up and he says, I'd love for you to come in and play. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, ooh. I said, okay. I'm like, but I'm still thinking my music and what y'all are doing is two totally different things. But I'm still not thinking that there's a fine line between bass music and breaks. Mm. And so uh, I go in and, you know, the next show we go back up and I do the show and it was just, it was just insane. But Sandy played this one song and uh, there's a little 10 inch record called Two Bad Mice, Bomb Scare. And uh, I ran up to him and I said, I like that song. And he looked at me, he says, you like this? <laughs> I'm like, I like that song. He says, if I give you this record, would you play it? I said, definitely. And so he says, okay. And so as soon as he took that record off, he gave it to me and I still have it. And that song is what started me into getting into breaks and loving breaks to this day. Wow. That's but, a great story. But that resurged my career because bass music had died, you know, and because it had died the way that it did, there was no going back to bass music because it had died. Mm -hmm. So now with Sandy, now I have a career in breaks, you know, so now I'm like, oh, cool. You know, so then everybody was like, well, why you stop doing bass music? Well, I didn't stop doing bass music because I wanted to. I stopped doing it because I had no choice, you know, because I'm like, you can't keep putting money into something and keep doing stuff into a genre of music that's dead. You know, and uh, it was it was gone, you know. So if people think back to like 96, 97, 98, you will think there were no bass songs. There was nothing coming out. The, the genre had just died. So with Sandy, when he did that for me, it kind of gave me a new life, you know. And so now that's why I say I'm forever grateful for what Sandy did to me. So I tell him, like, and I tell him that, man, like, that ain't true. That ain't true. But I, I tell the world. That if it wasn't for him and then bringing me in and doing what he did, it, Magic Mike would have been done in 98. Wow, that's an amazing story. And it's yeah. funny, too, like how you have these these things, right? Like, how many stories did you just tell, right? Like, you're in Miami making an album. <laughs> doesn't work out. You leave. They take your music. Yep. Anybody else would have been game over, regular job, you know? But yeah. you have so many of those. That's, that's amazing. I, I love it. I, I mean, I love what I do. So it's kind of hard to... You can't get in and like, I can't get out now. I'm going to ride till the wheels fall off because yeah. this, this is what I do. This is what I, I, I'm doing what I love to do, you know? So it's like, I can't get out now, you know? So it's like, now I have a, a totally different career, a whole different mindset, a different mode of why I'm doing this. You know, I'm older, you know, I can kind of back myself in a corner now and just analyze everything. You know, and not say anything, just sit and analyze and think about things and say, yeah, we're not going to do that. We're going to we're going to do this instead. You know, so it's just giving things thought and thinking, you know, that's really good. Guys, we got a 182 viewers right now. We're about to break 200 uh, shares. Make sure you share, share, share it. Yeah, share, share it. Uh, what's crazy is you guys are really hitting them with the questions. You got to see these questions, bro. They're going nuts. Uh, in here. I see one from Jay. <laughs> Jay McGowan is Jay Ski from Quad City and Six Nine Boys. What up, Jay? Jay, I would love for bass music to make a comeback. And um, and actually, um, God, I'm talking too much now. Oh, I want uh, to. Yeah, we got, Jay, we got to talk, man. <laughs> we got Mike talking. This yeah, is we, uh, clarity, just yeah, so we you guys know. Reach out, man. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's, um, it's coming back now, but it's coming back in the older ways. You know, people appreciate bass music again. You know, so... I think that's a good thing. Um, people are not appreciating new bass music yet. So it's going to have to be done in a way where it sounds old, but is new. Mm. And we'll leave it at that. And then we'll and we'll go from there. Jay, call me, dog. <laughs> call him. There we go. We're creating history right now. We're connecting yeah. some people. First of all, we got Ma- Magic Mike talking, which is a rarity because he's just not. He's very low key. Yeah, I don't he's very know. low key. But he's excited. He's smiling. He's talking about music, the history. This is great. Shout out to Lady Shay. Shout out to you, Tampa. In the what up, Shay? Tampa in the building. <laughs> Tampa in the building. Let's talk about Jimmy Jocelyn. He's like a like an old town hero, like vet. Let, let's. Yeah. How, how'd you meet him, and 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 how was that relationship? Jimmy was my arch nemesis back in the day in the skating rink days because really? like, yeah because um D- Jimmy DJed at uh, a skating rink called Pirates Cove and uh it was on it was Pirates Cove somewhere off of OBT uh in Orlando when I was at the rival skating rink I was at Skate World 
and uh so not rival rivals so don't don't take that i mean it's just a literal sense. friendly competition uh, right yeah and uh so he was uh i was at skate world he was at pirates cove and you know i'm better than you my skating ring better than yours you know blah 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 and and that that's how that was but we we were always friends and then like we were both in in the in the uh, marching band you know i played trumpet he played trumpet you know so it was it was a different kind of a we were friends you know but we were just it was friendly you know so as we got older and became adults we just and then actually at one point jimmy was working at cheetah like we brought him into the label uh to start working you know so jimmy's been with me dude probably longer than anybody that i could that i know of right now you know just because he goes back all the way back to my you know to my history of being in the skating ring you know 13 14 years old djing so yeah but jimmy uh jim is a good dude man staple staple great i yeah. met him at uh 180 roof uh gray goose lounge 180 yeah he does uh well well when everything opens back up he does mondays there mm. so yeah the industry night yep Shout out to FA73. So he's from Italy and he asks, how do you, how do you see bass in the future? Um, being here in Florida um, and playing it, like I play it pretty much everywhere, like especially traveling in the States. I get to dabble in it pretty much everywhere that I go. Um, but people as i said earlier they appreciate the old stuff um and they appreciate new stuff if it sounds like the old stuff you know so it's going to have to be done in a way that they think it's new you know but sounding old you know it's it's, it's just kind of weird because like and there's still a couple people you know still putting out bass music like sh shout out to kilo like kilo uh, in atlanta kilo ali he got a new one out that's just banging uh, him and Smurf, mm. dope, dope song. Um, but it, when you play it, like you have to really be careful because if no one knows it, then it's like, ah, and they just a think they think that it's something new that doesn't fit into the scheme of what's going on, you know. So it's just gonna have to take it's gonna take some some pushing, you know. But I think it's gonna come back. Um, in what facet, I have no idea, you know, but. I like I like it all, so we just gonna keep working with it, you know, keep moving with it. Mm, that's good. Jason Brown says he still has those test presses from Cheetah. Oh wow, <laughs> they might be they might be worth a lot of money. You might want to hold on to them. Jason, you probably got those from Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> My brother from another mother. Okay, this is awesome, man. We got so many great, great uh, DJ jams in the house. What's up? How you doing? Uh, bass mu music is making a, a huge comeback, and Mike mm -hmm. will be part of it. That's great. Yep, so, Troy Tucker. Hello, Troy. How are you? Drop the bass is a classic. We got people from uh, Guadalajara, Mexico, Germany. I mean, they're all in here. Belgium, they're everywhere. Yeah, man. So gonna be. So this that's is great. A blessing, man. I, I think the thing that people are enjoying right now is they get to ask you the questions live. So I think this is something that uh, uh, they're asking about the House of Blues. Is there anything you know? Obviously, I know there's gonna be some limits probably on sizes, and that's a big location. But was there anything in the works of bringing that party back or anything like that? Well, I was scheduled to do Memorial Day. Um, that was already in the works, and we were working on the date. Well, then, you know, Miss Rona showed up and then reared her ugly head, so that kind of messed all of that up. Um, but as far as uh, on a consistent basis, like every Sunday again, probably not. You know, I would love for it to happen. But um, for some reason, Disney did not like that night. You know, House of Blues loved the night, but Disney didn't like the night. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm just kind of fortunate that they – let me do holiday weekends you know so hopefully you know if things kind of change we can get back in and start doing it again but we'll keep the holidays for now until you know something else changes now how long did that party last because that was oh, there. Jesus. it started in 97 98 and lasted yeah. what 2017 not, 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 you know dj sandy started that night <laughs> wow <laughs> you know? okay. yeah so think about that history um and so it started 97, 98, and ended in uh, 2015. Oh, wow. That's almost a 20-year run. 18-year yeah, run. Man. There we go. Yeah, man. That's good. Uh, James Wolf says, so let's see if he comes up, and he says he needs you to sign. Let me see. James B. Wolf says, I need you to sign my 212-inch uh, remix of your Planet Rock. Oh, wow. Done. 
get it to me. If I see you somewhere, I'll sign them. There you go. That's the guy here. I see uh, Magic wait here. Let's see. Appreciate the carbon from Rome. Oh, so uh, people from Rome in here. Let's see what else we got. Brazil, like your fan. Look at this. I like Rome. Oh. I, like, I, I like Rome. I've never been to Brazil. I need to go there one day. You guys got to invite him. Got to get a, a, a either a breaks uh, a venue or, or or a base. Yeah, actually, you know what? He can do anything because I've seen I him. Can. I've seen I him do ADM and trap and. I like it all. I uh, yeah, I've seen him. I've seen him to kill it. I might not like everything in every genre, but what I do is I find music inside the genre that I do like, and then that's how I build my arsenal. Mm. That's good. That's good. Mm -hmm. All right. So DJ Shens uh, says he's a huge fan and wants to know if you ever did anything with Jazzy Jeff. Uh, because he said you guys are his favorite DJs. Never done anything with Jazzy. Mm. Have you met him before? Have you run it? Never met him, but Jazzy used to be my favorite DJ too. So oh, go. we got we got something in common now. So uh, Grant says he would love to see you come down to Palm Beach for an old school night. Set it up, y'all. <laughs> Palm Beach ain't far. That's easy. That's two hours. Winf Winfield says that uh, Mike, Mike, a documentary, my brother. Let's do it. <laughs> I definitely see. That. I don't know about that one. So they say that they, you're the king of bass from 1986 to 2020. This is what I'm saying. Oh, wow. wow, that's awesome. That's a big deal. Uh, he did mention him early. Let's see what else we got here. Uh, sample master. Okay, so let's get into some of the new stuff. I think we did a lot, a lot of questions. Uh, his house music from New Orleans. There we go. Was off the chain. This is good. Uh, okay, so here we go. Scotty B. That's Yoda. So we'll do it. Uh, Kova asked Mike what his favorite country song. <laughs> Do you have a favorite country song? I do. I love country. I listen to country every day. I didn't know that. Oh. Yeah, it's like my favorite genre of music. No way. What's your favorite country song? A little more summertime. Jason Aldean. There you go. Yep. So James B. Wolf said it would be a bass documentary. Your documentary would be a bass. We bass like that. <laughs> yeah, we like that. That's that's a good way to put it. Bass documentary. So once you put out your two records, I mean they're they're hugely successful. I know you guys put out a bunch of records after. Mm -hmm. You said uh, some of them went gold and stuff. Uh, when did it start? That start to fizzle out, and then your next uh, phase. Nine, Ninety-five. Ninety-five is when uh, I say the tides turned in ninety-five. It was just um, a lot of a lot of negative things started happening um, at the label um, that was out of my control, um, and a lot of negative things started happening with life as well. Mm. Um, so it was just. Um, and then I had left to go to L.A. because I had to go out and produce the 12 gauge project. And then when I went out and I did that, um, things kind of went went south for the most part. Um, and then when I came back, thank you, love. When um, when I came back, it was I had a different mindset. I had a different way of thinking, because when I went, I was already like borderline at the point of wanting to just back out of the label at that point um but it's kind of hard to back out of something that you that you own 50 percent of mm. um but i just had a different mindset and so 95 is when everything just kind of shifted for me and in 96 it it was all over it was done that was it that was it yeah now you did some independent well actually you did something with interscope correct it, it, my, i did i did a uh i did a mixtape through them and we called it buddha's in motion yeah. And uh, and Buddha's emotion was huge, like, and uh, what I did is we licensed. It was a couple of remixes of mine on there. Like I remixed, um, I did a new song. I remixed Bone Thugs and Harmony, Crossroads. Um, it was it was uh, different because it was a mix, and we just took and licensed all the songs uh, that I liked, uh, bass wise, that we could get our hands on. Like some some songs we tried to license, and the people said no. And uh, but for the most part, license the songs and I just made, you know, a 60, 70 minute mix, you know, so it's just all the songs seg right to each other. And uh, Interscope put it out and released it. And we did, I want to say, like 250 on that mixtape, which was just amazing. And um, so then it was time to do um, Buddhas in Motion 2, or more Buddhas in Motion, because we did both of them. And then uh, the label that I was going through to get it through to uh to Interscope, they couldn't get the deal right. So then they wound up just putting it out themselves. And then that one did 200,000 as well. So we did, did real well with Buddhas in Motion, man. That was uh, early 2000, like 99, 2000, somewhere up in there. Yeah. That's insane. That's mm -hmm. really good. 
Now we're gonna give away a t-shirt really quickly. So I need your DJ name and where you're from. I need you to uh, put it in there. Also, let me know if you shared this. Once you share, you let me know you shared. We're gonna be enter you to win a, a t-shirt before the end of the show. Uh, another thing too is we're also gonna put our, our sponsor KPODJ.com. Shout out to them. Uh, we're gonna put in the giveaway link. We're giving away streaming lights. It's uh, two Ape Labs uh, Ape sticks. They're four hundred fifty dollar value. They come with a remote stands hook up and stuff like that and i know everybody's streaming right now so we'd love for you guys to win them so make sure you click the link below uh or tweak music tips forward slash giveaway now you get to this point um uh, interscope you kind of went back to djing for a while right like it, it, that i was, was, I was back well that was in that during that time i was back into my djing because now i did the buddha's emotion which was pretty much base because that was it was seemed like it was starting to try to come back at that point, but it was just, it was just weird. But now I'm into the breakbeat world, so my DJing took precedent, you know, precedence over over anything that I was doing musically at that point. Um, so I didn't want to let that go because it was like a newfound love that I had gotten involved with, and it was just fun, you know. So yeah, I was I was straddling the fence on both. But I was more so into my DJing at that point, more so than doing anything musically. Mm, interesting. Now, did that time away make you miss it, or or was it just a, a much needed time away just from the business? Because it seemed like the business was really what what wore you down, or was the it the business did wear me down? Um, yeah, I miss DJing, but when I when I let it go, I let it all go. So from ninety, probably the end of ninety six to maybe probably the beginning of 98, I did nothing. Like I just, nothing. I didn't DJ, I didn't put music out. I pretty much didn't do anything. You know, we had our albums uh, slated already that I recorded with, you know, with Techmaster. But during that time, it was just, it was almost like a cleansing period, just trying to figure out, you know, what's getting ready to happen? What am I getting ready to do? And then that was when Sandy kind of came and took me under his wing. And then it was, um, telling you it was it was a newfound world for me because this was something that was going on and happening that i just had no clue of you know but when you get so deluged in your world you it's kind of hard to see you know everything else going going on elsewhere you know that's good now mm -hmm. after that you did take some time and then you went into the download and streaming world like, talk to us about that transition <laughs> the well the streaming is now um but uh, the download and streaming world started, I want to say, 90, no, 2006, 2005, 2006. Um, and then all the uh, things started happening. And, you know, and it was just weird to me because, you know, people giving deals for music to put music, you know, through iTunes. I'm like, that's just kind of weird, you know, and I'm still not not putting two and two together about it because it's once again it's a different world it's a different avenue you know so i'm like well that's another revenue stream you know so i'm like if we can do this and it's you know it's successful then you know let everything keep growing in that way you know so i'm like okay let's do it you know so i teamed up with this label you know with this um online distributor and um uh, they took all the old music and you know put it out and so now they you know Release, it's it's out and so the streams and and everything it's um it's a different world you know it's um it's totally different um i'm still you know we in 2020 and i'm still not used to it um part of me still wants to press up a record you know i want to press up a cd you know i i want to give somebody something physical mm. you know um the whole streaming world i guess i'm getting I'm okay with it now because I know the significance of it, you know, because now it's like, wow, you know, when you see residuals come from that, you're like, wow, okay, you know, I didn't expect that, you know, so it's a good thing, but uh, I'm still, there's still an old school side of me that I want an album, I want, give me a CD, you know, give me something, give me something tangible, you know, and um, yeah, but I'm I'm getting used to it now. It it took a a minute, you know, and I've been as far as like my older music, it's been it has been being streamed for 
ooh, 15 years now, 10, over 10 years, 10, 12 years. Yeah, long time. So um, I'm getting used to it now. It's still just not the same, but. Got it, got it. Now, what I love about you is you still work on music. I mean, we talk, we chat all the time, right? You're like, text me late because okay. I'll be in the studio. Yeah, so that's an that's an interesting thing. Uh, and and you make time to do this all the time, or do you take little breaks? How does that work? Nope, nope. If you take a break, you won't go back to it. <laughs> so, so this is this is my life. This is what I do. So you do it pretty much a few times a week, almost every day. Every day. Got it. To do something every day. You have to do something every day to to hone in your craft to to stay up on it. Because if you don't, it's gone. That's you know? so good. I want you guys yeah. to rewind that because that's something you gotta. I, I see people that take three, four, five months. I nah, mean, I can see. Yeah, nah, nah, I ain't taking no time off. There we go. Nah, I'm, I'm gonna work, even if I'm working on something and I don't like what I'm doing. You know, then I'll find something else to do. Like I love my tables, so like if I'm trying to produce something or if I'm trying to work on a beat or something, and it's not coming out the way that I want to come out. I'm gonna jump on my tables and start practicing on something. You know, whether I'm practicing on some cuts or or something, but I'm going to do something, you know, every single day, you know, whether I'm organizing music or, you know, it's just, I want to do something to, to make my day feel productive to say, I did something today and this is what I did, you know? And then once I, once the day is done, then I can say, okay, this is what I did. I plan my next day. What do I need to do the next day? You know, did I, did I start on something that I didn't finish? I need to finish that. I need to continue that. And so that's, that's my mindset. You know, but I, I, it's a blessing to be able to do what I do. You know, it's like this, this is my life and this, I love, I love it, you know? So if you love it, then focus on it and, you know, flourish it. So it'll grow and then become something that you want, you know, you know, you want it to get even bigger. That's so good. So good. So valuable. I love that. I love that. So uh, tell us a little bit about like, so you work every day. Uh, you work on your sets, you work on your music. Um, now you've added live streaming to it. Now, how often do you think you'll be live streaming? I don't know, dude. Um, live streaming is almost like preparing for a show. <laughs> um, it's a lot of work, you know. Uh, and, the, and the thing is, once you turn the camera on and you hit the stream button, well, then the show was pretty much over on this side because now you're just implementing and you're playing. But the prep for the show is insane. And I didn't, I give everybody credit that's doing streaming and doing it, you know, doing it big because kudos to y'all because, man, it's, it's some work. You know, it's a lot of work. But I don't mind working. It's, it's fun, you know. Yeah. You know, brother, yeah. The, the whole stream thing is, is different. The thing is, like, with me, I don't plan sets. Like, it's just I can't plan a, I can't plan a set that's just um, – I mean, back in the day, you know, you would always plan sets and know what you're going to play here and there. And I don't plan sets. I haven't planned a set now in over 10 years. I just, I can't do it. So it's just, now it's like, I turn my computer on. I say, okay, what's going to be my first song? I'm like, okay, cool. And then I just kind of bob and weave with that and let it, I let my, my mind and my heart go where it needs to go, you know, but I can't plan. So even with the stream, you know, I'll know what genre of music I'm going to play, but I can't. I can't plan it. I'll go through a crate as as I'm playing a song. I'll see a song like, oh, I like that one. Will it go? Let's go. Let's play that one. You know, and yeah. and that's and that's how I that's how I play now. That's good. That's really good. Mm -hmm. What's crazy is, I, like I said, I, I like that they're interactive. They're big. They're they they do their thing. Obviously, your last one was breaks, right? It was strictly yeah. The last one was breaks. Yeah. The first one was bass. The last one was breaks. I have no idea what the next one's going to be. <laughs> So like, what's, your, what's your Twitch, by the way? Oh, DJ Magic Mike 01. Let's put this in now. 01 or just 01? 01. Zero 01. All right, let me put this in now. Let me, I'm uh, 01 on everything. 01. Okay, so let's yep. put this on here. We want to make sure we follow Magic Mike. Uh, he's someone you guys got to see this. Uh, I, I'm, it's one thing to talk about it, but it's another thing to experience. Uh, so I want to make sure I put this on here. Magic Mike 01. We'll get it on the screen. So it's... Twitch.tv forward slash Magic Mike, not DJ Magic. DJ, no, DJ Magic Mike. Oh, all right. Let me add that on there. Sorry about that. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> we'll get it on here. So DJ Magic Mike 01. Yeah, so make yeah. sure you do that. Also, yeah. you can follow him on Instagram. He's got a lot of cool stuff. You don't post a lot on Instagram, do you? I'm not big with Instagram, man, and I'm trying. Uh, Recon keep getting on me about it, man. <laughs> I just The old school part of me, man, social media is just not 
uh, I'm trying to, it's not my life. You know, it's like I can go all day and not think about social media at all, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, it's not my life. So usually the first thing that I gravitate towards is Facebook because it's just easy. And then now it's like everything is going towards the gram. So now I have to kind of back down from Facebook and go towards the gram. And I just, you know, I'm like, yeah, I'll get there. I'll get there when I get there. It's you know, funny. I did the same thing with Facebook when Facebook started. I wasn't into it. And then all of a sudden I said, OK, let's do this. And then now I'm all maxed out and can't add nobody and all kinds of craziness. So I, I'll get the gram. But yeah, recon stand on me about that, man. I, I'll get there. So, so how did you meet DJ Rincon? Shout out to him, DJ Rincon, Rincon in the building. Um, Rincon, I met him back. Um, we used to have this club downtown Orlando called Antigua, okay. and uh, and uh, Antigua was huge, man. <laughs> and and Rincon was our competition a couple doors down at at our Dragon Room, and uh, so that was how we met back then, and we just kind of became friends as and as we've grown older, we became closer, and now we're real good friends. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, we're going to give him three more questions because I want to be very respectful of his time. He's always doing this stuff. We're going to give you that T-shirt. So make sure you, you share it, put your name and put where you're from. And we're going to pick the winner in just about right after the three questions. So make sure you do that. Also, don't forget, we're going to give away uh, DJ lights. So I'll put the, all that stuff in there uh, from our sponsor, KPODJ.com. All right. So we got a couple. Uh, so somebody asked, what do you think about DJ competitions? Um. Most of the ones that I go to now, they bring me in as a judge, which is cool. Um, but I'm kind of hard on the DJs mm. um, because I know where I came from. You know, um, I I like competitions. I think it's, it's good for people. Um, but it doesn't, I don't know, I, I like them. Um, but most of the time I'm never at a DJ competition as a spectator. Mm. I'm always in a, in a competition as, you know, as a judge, you know, so. So what do you look for when you're the judge? Um, um, I like originality. I like them to show something that, um, I like, to, I like creativity. I like, I like to see something that I've never seen. I don't want to see. And the thing is, that's kind of hard because I've been DJing a long time and I've seen a lot. Um, I don't like to see things that people have kind of taken from somebody else, you know, because I know a lot of DJs and I've seen a lot of routines. Um, so that kind of that kind of gets me. Mm. You know, I'd like even if you even if you are not 100 percent where you want to be at, as long as you're original then you will get more from me. You know, you will get more, but you know, it's just, just a different, it's, I don't know. I'm just, I'm weird like that when it comes to the, you know, to the competitions. No, that's good. But I mean, it's good to hear it from a judge's perspective because sometimes you think, well, what are they looking for? Is it mm -hmm. technical is whatever. So yours seems to be originality. Right. I like originality. Okay. That's, that's my thing, you know, and as long as like, I like DJs that are precise, but I like originality. Originality is number one for me. That's good. That's yeah. good. Especially you've seen probably a, a ton of routines. I have a lot, <laughs> a lot, a lot. Oh, so, she said I was her judge, and I she appreciated the support. <laughs> <laughs> I did judge her. Uh, went uh, judge the uh, what was DMC um and For Lady Shay, right? Lady yeah, Shea. Lady Shea. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, Lady Shay, yeah. Shout out to her. So, yeah. Scotty BCs, what's your favorite needle? I'm still on my shores, my forty four sevens. I heard they're worth money. Is this true? Because they don't make they it. Probably, they probably are, but I'm not letting mine go. <laughs> and I was sponsored by Sure, so I didn't really have to pay for needles, thank God. And I still got like a nice little arsenal of them. So I'm gonna I'm gonna be good for a little while. That's good. This is good. Yeah, man. All right. So let's see what else we got. So we're gonna do one more question. We got it, and then we're picking the winner right away. Oh, I gotta open my water. Yeah, yeah. Open your water. All right. So we got so many people here. Okay, uh, so you said your favorite song you remixed. We already asked that one. That was Planet Rock. Mm -hmm. uh, mm, this is interesting. All right. Craziest tour story. Oh. Oh. Wow. 
I know oh, you got a good one. I know you got a good one. Uh, maybe something happened on stage. Maybe something before stage. Maybe you know a mishap. It's got to be something. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot. Um, <laughs> there we go. Not a lot that I want to put on the stream. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> is there a rated PG one or, or, or? Let's see. Most of them aren't bad. You know, they're not bad stories. It's just. Um, Fat Man Scoop had one that uh, a dog went across the, the 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 stage. He was like, "Yo, what the hell." He was in, I forget, Trinidad or something, and the dog just... Oh, wow. Yeah. So I thought that was interesting. I think... I don't know. Most of mine... I, I don't have any crazy stories, mm -hmm. um, you know, per se, but it's you, everything is an experience, whether good or negative. It's, it's all positive, you know? So what I, we've had some experiences on the road that, you know, it's just like, wow, did that happen? You know? But nah, we good. You're good, you're good. We're we, we gonna let that one go. <laughs> so, so, we'll get one of your OGs in here. So, DJ Rincon says, uh, What is your favorite artist that you know and have enjoyed seeing them grow from day one? Favorite artist? Um, wow. I don't have a favorite artist. Um, most of the artists that, that, I, that I appreciate and enjoy. There are, uh, there were like artists before I even started, you know, like Shaka. Shaka is my number one. Mm -hmm. Um, MJ, you know, I like artists like that. So, so Shaka Khan, yeah, uh, Shaka number one. Yeah, that, Shaka's number one for me. Ooh. Like Shaka does it for me. Yeah. Um, um, MJ, like you, those are my two. Like, so it's kind of, I don't have artists that you know, that came up that I can look back at and say, you know, like in our genre that I can say that, okay, I like what they, you know, what they're doing because I respect everybody for what they're doing. I respect the game, you know? So I have DJs that I respect, you know, that I like what they're doing and, you know, where they're in and, uh, you know, like where they're going, you know, um, more so than, than artists because, I'm DJing, you know, so I kind of look back and I look and I see, you know, what's going on with, with DJs, but I don't really pay a lot of attention to artists. Um, if I like the, if I like their music, then cool. And if I don't, then cool. You know, it's not a, it's not a big thing with me. I'm more, I'm more DJ based. That's awesome. This is a great question. And I think you would probably be the best person to answer this. You ready? Mm -hmm. So it says, how much does a supportive spouse help 100 percent, right yeah 100 percent. um like my wife has been in my life wow 20 25 years now 95 or 5 15 yeah 25 years hmm. and um important like be, you you can't begin to imagine how important that is and especially when they appreciate you and understand you and understand what you do you know she understands this life because this this life is brutal. You know, um, everybody can everybody can't handle it. You know, but because she loves me like that, I have nothing but respect for her. You know, so it's it's a mutual thing. So we we it's it's good. It's a good thing to have somebody that understands and appreciates and knows what you know what you're doing and what's going on. That's so good. That's yeah, that, that, that support system is insane, man. Uh, do you think you maybe wouldn't have done as much as you've done without that support system? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. That's that's kind of hard to say, man. That's when you'd have to ask. Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> Uh oh, hit my I hit the uh, Instagram thing. Okay. Oh, it's off anyway. Yeah, it's off. It only lasted an hour. We're going, we're going yeah. happy. All right. So we're gonna do one question and then we're gonna do a quick wrap it around. So yeah. let's, let's shout out to the uh the winner. We actually just picked out a winner, right? For, uh free t-shirt today. Shout out to him. Let's see what uh, okay. So the, the winner is let's see who we got here. This is opening up one second. Carlos DeSorbo, DJ Gadget, Jacksonville, Florida. Shout out to you. Shout out to Jacksonville. Shout out to Jacksonville in the building. Shout out to you guys, DJ Gadget. Uh, so here's what I need you to do. I need you to inbox me uh, your name, full name, address, phone number, and we'll make sure to uh, send you out that T-shirt. 
Uh, we'll send it out first thing tomorrow morning. But shout out to everybody who's on here. All right, couple questions, then we'll we'll move on and 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 we'll wrap it up. So, get up early, go to sleep late. I already know this answer. Yep, right. you already know. <laughs> go to sleep late. Get up late. Yep. All right. Uh, That's why we could never get this interview off. Fa yeah, exactly. <laughs> he was like, wait, 1 p.m. That's too early. I'm like, man, I'm a DJ. We I may not. One. I saw he was up. I saw he was up today at 11. So I really appreciate that. Yeah. Guy, preparing guy. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, favorite song that kind of that, that comes to mind. First one. Oh, that's Could be hard, man. First one. Come on, man. You got to think. Oh, think. Oh, God. Come on, man. There's got to be one. That, oof. Right now, like on your playlist, how about that? If you if you if you went to your playlist right now, we, we, we'll most of, the time I, most of the time I don't play my favorite songs because um usually my favorite songs have meaning. Like mm. I like um once again going back to like Egyptian song Shaka Khan, mm. Time Waits for No One, the Jacksons, Michael. Um it's it's, it's you know uh Rocket Love, Stevie Wonder. I listen to stuff like that because that kind of clears my head and makes me, you know, so those are my favorites, you know? So if you, if you hang around with me and ride around with me for like a day or so, then either you're going to hear me playing country music or something really, really old that you're probably not going to know what it is. Not going to know. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. They'll be learning with you. Yeah. Okay. Um, favorite book or podcast? Neither one. Neither one. Got it. Neither All right. One. Favorite quote? Um, it's on my wall right now. I don't know the key to success, but the key to failure is trying to please everyone. Mm, that's good. That's good. I, and I think that's something you really, really live by. Like that's, uh -huh. that's, that's legit, legit. Yeah. Because I'm not trying to please you no more. It's, I'm done. You're yeah. Done. That, the, those days are over. Toughest time in your career and when you, and how you overcame. Um, 95, um, 95 was a bad year. Um, there was just a lot, a lot of bad things happening in that year. Um, the best part of that year was I met my wife, mm. but everything else was just bad, you know? So that was how I overcame it by meeting her. That's so good. Mm -hmm. So, so good. Well, Mike, I want to thank you so much for your time. I want to really, been fun, really man. I can't believe I did it. Really? You did it, man. You, you didn't just do it. You came in, you did it big. Yeah. You did it big. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> You came out seriously. I want to thank you so much for your time. About it. No, seriously. What what was cool about today is we really got to uh, connect with the fans. We got to ask some questions. We got to kick it with them, and they got to know you because I know you have a lot, a lot of fan, uh, a big, big fan base from all over the world. Obviously, we saw Brazil, Germany, Rome, right, uh, Italy, and uh, so you know it was nice that you got to connect with them and just answer questions. And we have so many people that between the base and breaks, you know what I mean? Like you kind of got the uh, fine line, man. Yeah. Fine line. You got it's to tell the story. It's two different fan bases. Yeah. Shout out to yeah. DJ Sandy, Jim, uh, Jimmy Jocelyn. Yeah. Did you DJ Rincon, which is one of your new guys? He's 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 a great great guy. So, but it's uh I, real good man. What I'm really excited about now, uh, Mike, is to see you in Orlando next time. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully to be in a yeah. yeah. Whenever you can get down here again. When I can get down there, yeah, <laughs> man. I'd, I'd love to see you at one of your big events again and just uh, just have a shot. It'll happen. We'll have a, we'll have a good time. We'll have a shot. We have a shot. That's his favorite thing. That's his favorite thing right there. He's like, shot? That's when you catch his attention. You'll be like, what? Shot? We'll have a shot. There it is. My guy. Well, thank you so much, man. We really appreciate right. you. Appreciate you, man. I'm glad we had this. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, I want to thank you so much for watching this. Guys, we see you soon, and we'll catch up later.